Hi, I'm Dave Rawlinson. I'm a co-founder here at Heavy Robotics. Uh, my technical work uh, is mostly leading up mechanical engineering and controls. I'm going to give a presentation on motion control, uh, particularly how we control position, velocity, and torque on uh, Heavy's actuators. So to start off with a little bit of an overview, I'm going to go into kind of what I mean by motion control, particularly low-level motion control. I'm going to do kind of a quick overview of PID control, which is the style of controller that we use at low level. It's probably the most common controller out there. I'll talk about how we combine position, velocity, and torque PID controllers uh, in a cascaded way to provide uh, control of our actuators. And then I'm going to go through some examples of both uh, position, velocity, uh, torque control, because we're series elastic actuators, we have uh, really good uh, precise torque control and controllers for that. And then I'll show the benefits that can be had from combining position and velocity control, as well as the position, velocity, and torque control, so that you can get good motion control while trying to remain as compliant as possible. So for, for motion control, kind of at the low level, in, in kind of plain English, it's making, making a machine move the way, the way that you want it to. Uh, it is basically the goal of taking kind of a desired path through space. Maybe it's position, maybe it's force, but you want the machine to follow that in a close way or track that in a close way. So when people talk about tuning their controllers or a good controller, they're talking about something that tracks well or has very low tracking error. Uh, motion control is not figuring out what those uh, motions are, right? That's the role of uh, planning or trajectory generation. Uh, this assumes that you already essentially have a plan or a path or a set of points that you want to move through uh, and that change over time. And this is just about getting that hardware to actually execute on that. At the low level, you can essentially do that in a closed loop fashion where you take sensor feedback in the actuator and feed that back in and iterate on that to change the commands automatically. Or you can run open loop, which basically means sending commands to the actuator without any feedback, without any sensors. So an example of this is, is stepper motors in printers and, and 3D printers. They actually operate with no feedback to get keep costs down, but they're motors that are designed to uh, respond very uh, consistently to position commands. And uh, when we talk about tracking, when we talk about trajectories, motions, these can be positions, they can be velocities, uh, and they can be forces, torques, right? Or they could be any combination of the three. To actually close the loop, we rely on PID control. Uh, it's probably the most common form of, uh, of, of feedback controller. So basically we have sensors on the motor, or in this case we have sensors directly on the output, in our actuators, and then these controllers generate motion commands uh, based on the error between some desired sensor value and what those sensors actually are. So when people talk about PID controllers, they usually describe them visually in block diagrams like this. Um, I'm gonna go pretty quickly through PID control. If you'd like to know more, there's a lot of resources on the internet. The Wikipedia page is, is pretty good. That's where this diagram uh, is pulled from. Um, for whatever reason, the pseudocode, which I find to be the most useful uh, part of, you know, let's say I need to implement a PID control, that's buried way at the bottom in like section 10 or 11. So if you go to Wikipedia, maybe look at this image and then just scroll all the way down to the bottom. I don't know why it's so far down there, but I, I think it's one of the more useful things. So a PID controller has uh, three parts. Uh, there's the, the P, the I, and the D. The P is a proportional component which multiplies your current error. So if you're iterating through every time step, your error at this time step gets multiplied by a value that gets sent to the motor. There's an integral term that integrates over past error over time and adds that in. So if essentially if you've been lagging behind for let's say the last 10, 20 time steps, you can multiply by that, multiply that by some value, feed that in. Then there's a derivative term that looks at how the error is changing and essentially sort of tries to predict ahead and add in a term to um, react to where you think the error is going. And these get summed together and tuned, and you have your P, I, and D. So kind of the, the ghost of error present, the ghost of error past, and the ghost of error future get added in to decide your actuator's fate. 
there's also a second part that's that's often used, especially on electric motors, and that's a, basically a feed forward term, where based on our desired command, frequently we can multiply it by some number that gives us a pretty good guess of what the command going to the motor should be. So for example, with electric motors, if you have a command of velocity, well, we know the gear ratio and the, the speed constant, we can feed a command directly into the, to the motor that doesn't even rely on feedback, maybe gets us most of the way there. Likewise with torque, maybe if you know your motor's torque constant and you know the gear ratio and maybe maybe a rough guess of your some of your friction parameters, you can feed a command directly to the motor that probably, again, gets you most of the way toward what it is you're trying to command. When you're trying to tune a loop, kind of one way I think about it is your, your feedback part of the loop is, is reacting to surprises, right? Error. And so if you can do things ahead of time to reduce kind of how much your, your feedback loop has to react to, uh, that's generally a good thing. So one thing people usually ask about PID control is, okay, how do you tune these controller gains? And so by these gains, I mean these Ks over here in the blocks, right? Each one of these is a number, which is I take my error, I multiply it by some number, and then I add it in. And these numbers have a, a really big effect on how your controller performs. And the right answer is there is, there is no kind of magic bullet unfortunately, especially for complex systems like arms and legs, it really does depend on the application. One rule of thumb I have though, is use as much information as you can. So if you can command positions, velocities, and torques and combine them, start off trying to do that if you can, um, because it's basically more information that your controllers can use so that hopefully you're not relying on carefully tuning these. Overall, I'll say lower gains are better. Again, this is, this is, an overgeneralization, but if you're working on robots that are interacting with people or working in a, in a, a less known environment, one of the things you might care about on a controller is kind of how it reacts at the margins, right? How aggressively does it, does it respond if it's not on its desired trajectory? And so lower gains tend to be more stable, more predictable, maybe not generate as high forces when your system starts to do something that maybe you didn't expect or, or encounter something it didn't expect. If you're doing position control, kind of in this spirit, start with low uh, KP, low position gains, proportional gains, and, and increase if you have to. Adding damping can be good. Essentially, that's the, the D term, the KD. Or if you're commanding velocities, the, the way our system's set up, the KP on velocity, the, the proportional gain on velocity is the same thing as the derivative gain on the position. Another rule of thumb is that if you find yourself relying on a really big integral term, it's not that that's a, a bad thing, but it's frequently a sign that there's something else that you should be modeling uh, or could be modeling, but maybe aren't. So for instance, if you have an arm that's resisting gravity, you could take that out with a with an I term. But if your arm starts to move around, you know, in large parts of the, the workspace, that I term might wind up and cause problems. And maybe what you should be doing is is modeling gravity and, and providing kind of a feed forward torque or effort so that the I term isn't doing kind of too much reactive work. So that's the individual PID loop. What we do on our actuators and what a lot of other people do is combine these in a cascaded fashion so that you can do kind of any combination of position, velocity, or torque, or do, do commands in, individually. So the way this is set up, the main thing you'll see is that the position command actually cascades through uh, a torque loop, or in this case, it's called an effort loop at the low level. And this has the advantage that, first of all, your position commands, the gains on that, rather than being magic numbers, are kind of a, a real world meaningful value. They're essentially a stiffness, uh, Newton meters of torque per radian of error. Uh, that can be then summed with an additional torque command uh, to get sent to the motor. And then what you'll see with the velocity loop is rather than passing through the effort loop, it also goes directly to the motor. We found that this is useful because, uh, again, of those feed forward terms that I mentioned. For electric motors, going from a desired velocity to a motor voltage, in this case, you know, PWM, but essentially going from velocity to voltage, there's a really good feed forward term that we can use. And then for torque, going from desired force or torque to voltage, works if essentially if you're at stall. So essentially if you command a torque uh, that would that would desire a voltage uh, at stall and then sum that with a velocity that produces a voltage if there was no load, you can sum those two. And if you know what your desired torque is, you know what your desired velocity is, you can add those 
um, in a pretty graceful way. So you can think of the actuator in pretty abstract terms of positions, velocities, and torques. So the first example I'm going to go through is just regular position control. On our actuators, it does actually go through the effort loop. You can configure the effort loop or the torque loop so that it isn't using feedback. In that case, it's, it's purely feed forward. It's essentially acting as a unit conversion, again, so that you can have your position gains uh, be somewhat more intuitive. You can know that they're roughly you know, a spring constant in newton meters per radian. Because we're series elastic actuators, though, you can actually incorporate effort feedback, and that, that makes the, the actuator kind of actively compliant on the output and allows it to behave you know, very closely to uh, kind of a virtual spring. So one way we can study position controllers is by performing step inputs on the system. Um, in this case, we do large changes in position, and we have a soft P controller, a gain of about 3 newton meters per radian, that tries to pull that output to that commanded position. If we increase those gains, we can see we respond much more quickly. It snaps to position, but now we have some oscillation and some overshoot. And so this is traditionally fixed by adding in uh, a D term, a damping term, where we still get that, that fast response, but now we'll, uh, we'll have removed that, that overshoot. So you see you get a quick convergence, there's still a little bit of overshoot, but for the most part, that derivative term looks at how the error changes and prevents things from oscillating. Another way to study a control loop or, or tune it is to command a sine wave and see how it tracks over time. So we're following again with those soft gains after about 10 seconds, I increase those gains to 15 newton meters per radian, so five times stiffer. Uh, and you can see the tracking improves, and you can sort of also see the stiffness effects by slight oscillations that you see in torque uh, and in, in velocity. So in addition to position, we can command velocity. In this case, the velocity loops that we run run directly to uh, motor voltage. And again, this is because in that velocity PID block that you see, there's a, essentially a pretty good feed-forward term that we can use to give our controller a good starting point in terms of how much voltage we should give the motor for a desired velocity. So running a uh, velocity command on an actuator that has you know, only light load on the output gives really good tracking. Interestingly, kind of the position is really just integrated from whatever your velocity commands are, so there's nothing anchoring position in the world. So if you bump into it or shift it, the resulting position will kind of drift around depending upon how the velocity signals integrate in. Uh, but you can see that we're tracking velocity quite well, but we're doing it in a, a fairly compliant way. So that's a piece of information that we can use later. Lastly, our actuators are series elastic actuators. So they have a spring on the output that we can sense its deflection and use it to track torque. So this is a torque controller that runs on the module that you can think as essentially running position control, but to the deflection of a spring rather than an actual output position. So when you start commanding torque, the results of it can sometimes be a little unintuitive. We're only commanding plus or minus one newton meters, but the actuator moves very quickly, essentially because it's not being restrained through space. So if we do clamp the output, uh, you'll see that the motion stops, and now we can kind of fulfill that plus or minus one newton meter of torque. So because we're commanding torques, this is a, a good compliant motion that we can use to improve tracking uh, of higher up loops like velocity and position uh, while still not making a system that's, that's stiff. So now we can start combining things together. We're going to take the position and velocity loops that we saw earlier and take the resulting voltages from the inner torque loop and the velocity loop and sum them together to improve tracking. And in this case, we can also add the, some compliance to the system by making the uh, inner torque loop actively compliant. So we're starting off going to be tracking that sine wave like we did before. It's going to be a larger, slightly larger, slightly slower so that we get to higher velocities. And you can see I have that lag because I'm running with those soft position gains that I had earlier. And after about 10 seconds, I turn on velocity commands. And what you'll see is the tracking dramatically improves even though I haven't changed the gains from the, the higher torque loop. What you'll see is this leaves, I'm getting good tracking, but I'm still getting compliance. So if I grab the arm, you know, it does fight because it is still trying to track those commands, but not nearly as hard as when I was doing just that naive position control with stiff gains. Position plus velocity gives me the same or better tracking, uh, but in, uh, with a more compliant uh, set of gains on the controllers. And so lastly, we'll put all three together, the position and velocity commands that we just saw, 
and now we're actually going to add in a feed forward torque command uh, based on desired accelerations. So this is the same sine waves we were running earlier. I'm going to run a little bit faster, and we've added one and a half kilograms of weight to the end of the arm, about a foot out from the actuator. So this basically increases the inertia load of the output by about 10 times. Since we know roughly the inertia, we can basically multiply that by the desired acceleration because we're tracking a sine wave, and we can use that information as well to improve tracking. So you can see we start off doing our position control. We're lagging a little bit, but this time we're overshooting, right, because there's a lot of inertia that is carrying the actuator way past where it's being commanded. If we add in velocity control, it improves things maybe slightly, but really doesn't change things much because the, the big problem is with torque. And you're seeing these oscillations to plus or minus, you know, four or five Newton meters. And if we feed in the appropriate amount of torque, what you'll see is our actual commanded torques go down because we're essentially feeding in the right amount of acceleration. We're kind of pulling back as we go to one end and accelerating as we start into the other. And so using that information uh, improves tracking, keeps the system compliant, and actually draws significantly less power, again, because we're not really surprising our control loops. We're giving them everything they need to kind of anticipate position, velocity, and torque, which in this case is largely driven by dynamics acceleration. So in summary, we've covered some methods that we can use to achieve uh, low-level control. In this case, we use joint-level PID controls and feed-forward control, and again, kind of talked about feed forward at two levels. The inner loops of velocity and torque have feed forward terms that help improve their tracking, but kind of at a high level, uh, we think of things as position, velocity, and torque. So we've used these cascaded PID loops to essentially track a position, but feed in velocity and torque commands as well to improve that position tracking. And we showed that how doing all of this can enable really good motion control uh, with low gains. And uh, we think this is important for creating robots that act in the, the real world, in places where you might need to be interacting with a person, something where you need to be safe when you wind up deviating from your trajectories, and just overall have a system that is more consistent and reliable. And that's it. Thanks for watching. Uh, if you'd like to contact us, you can reach us at uh, info at heavyrobotics.com. Uh, a lot of what I presented here is uh, from the documentation that we have at docs.heavy.us. If you'd like to ask a question, uh, we'd really love it if you could post on our community forums, forums.heavy.us. Uh, thank you for watching. I hope you found this helpful. Uh, please stay safe and wash your hands.